not observe it for themselves. We're looking here today at terrorist organizations. Organizations and groups which have a political aim and want to champion a cause in society. But the primary difference from them and other legitimate groups is that they use violence and the murders of innocents and the propagation of terror in order to achieve these aims. These groups are such as Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, and Hezbollah in society today. The political groups we're talking about are groups which are explicitly linked to the terrorist organizations. They act as governmental representatives and aim to get as many seats as possible in the election process. They share the same funding, the same ideals, the same mechanisms as these terrorist organizations in gaining support for their cause. We see this in the case of Hamas, where in 2006, even after it was elected into the governing party, it was still championing violence against people. National parliaments today are governmental bodies which formulate policies regarding the entire nation's affairs. The country's affairs and policy direction in general to the public utilities of society are going to be championed and also discussed at the national platform, where you need some political leaders in order to lead the country forward and ensure efficient government. Our policy is simple. We will disallow political wings from running elections and gaining seats. We will allow members who belong to terrorist organizations to stand for elections only if they break away entirely, renounce all violence and links to terrorism, and form separate political parties, essentially making them an entirely different political entity entirely and no longer standing for terror. Any politician or group which is found to have links to terrorists will be banned from elections wholesale. This debate assumes the idea of that there's already a sound electoral process in place, and this debate is on which side best ensures the continuation of free and fair elections. As a first speaker, I'll be dealing with three points. Firstly, on how their side legitimizes terrorism. Secondly, makes politics more violent. And thirdly, divides society. My second speaker will then tell you about how this causes a loss of international support and also destabilizes the region entirely. To my first argument about how this legitimizes terrorism. The thesis for this argument is that allowing political wings of terrorist organizations to stand for national parliaments legitimizes the use of violence to champion a cause. It endorses terrorist organizations and these political wings because it's saying that if you can gain as much media attention as you want from a bomb attack, you are legitimate also to stand on parliament at the same platform as any other peaceful organization and political party which is now recognized as a legitimate society today. This then rewards them with seats in parliament, even though they undermine the legitimacy and the sanctity of life of people in society today. And now they can gain attention even more by enhancing terrorism and also sending a visceral message to society that hey, you can just use, hold on a minute, that you can actually use terror to gain legitimacy and gain popular support. This is wrong, but yes. Not violent in nature is what she just said. Terrorist organizations by themselves are the ones enhancing terror in society. As long as you don't enact violence, you're never going to cause this threat to society fundamentally. So these people are definitely going to propagate the terror. And political wings openly support the terrorist attacks, such as the IRA being supported by Sinn Féin. They don't renounce it, but by the same, it's perfectly legitimate to check their cause. This is fundamentally wrong. Moving back to the argument then, even more so because of a point of information, now it's even more crucial for us not to legitimize violence. We see this in the case of 2010, where Hamas, the ruling party of the Gaza Strip, actually attacked four Israeli innocents and killed a pregnant woman in a car where they were just driving innocently in the West Bank. This kind of government-sponsored terrorism and also the ability of them to say in national parliaments we are going to support these causes is all the more going to enhance the idea of violence being legitimate. Because if a political party can stand on national elections, stand in the national parliament and say violence is all right, this is going to perpetuate the idea of violence in the world. This is significant because the entire plan and the evolution of society today is to ensure that society and innocence are safe and not harmed. So my second argument about how this makes politics more violent. The thesis for this argument is that allowing political wings of terrorist organizations to stand for elections underlies politics, the use of violence to gain traction in the political scene. Here, terrorist organizations and then their political wings aren't going to change their mentality once they get into government or go for elections. Why is this so? Because the very thing that got them into government in the first place, or even standing for elections, is the use of terror. Because they're going to be seen as weak and vulnerable once they renounce terror, they have no incentive to do so. And this is going to be even a more legitimate cause for the state because we can only be hurt by terror and the use of violence, we're going to do it all the more. Then they actually use it as a trap card over the electorate and over the system by assassinating and killing people of opposition parties 
parties killing dissenters who say that their cause is not right because they're going to be having these extremist ideas and still having the kind of thoughts they're having all along. So instead, you actually have to electorate harming, getting harm and democracy being undermined society because violence becomes a key element of the unstable political systems we see in today's society. So we recognize this in the case of the Pakistani Taliban which tried to gain seats in the election and they actually used selective terrorism during the election to subvert the democratic processes in Pakistan. And this was just as recently as May 11 this year. So they actually intimidate voters not to vote using these terrorist attacks and she causes people to even fear going to the polls themselves, undermining the kind of democracy they want in society today. And these are the very leaders that we want to have on national parties. We don't think this is fair. And even more than that, because now they have this ability to say every time a new bill that's going to be passed is something we don't like, we're going to just bomb another building, we're just going to assassinate the person, and this is not going to ensure that politics remains fair and a platform of legitimate discourse in society. Yes, ma'am. became known as a terrorist organization, resorting to extremist tactics in response to what they perceived as a foreign invasion and occupation of their country by the Western imperialist states. They behaved very much like an NGO, ladies and gentlemen. They provided basic health care and services for the population suffering from an inept and effectively non-existent state. The reason why these groups eventually resorted to violence was because there was no other alternative under the status quo. The moment the US decided to accuse them of, of harboring, the, harboring Osama bin Laden and use the 911 as a pretext to invade and ravage Afghanistan with the Western media painting the Taliban as a terrorist group, we think that that's when everything went wrong. With the rise of the Islamic extremist groups since 2011, 
any group with Muslim um, affiliation that resorts to violence are now given the blanket label of terrorists. We think that that's inherently bad and outside is going to prove to you how we can best solve the problem. We think that the criteria of today's debate is a cost-benefit analysis as to which side leads to a better outcome for the people. It's important for side proposition to engage with the problem of debate. No, thank you, sir. And the, the fact, the problem is that there's the fact that there's, there are such terrorist organizations that exist, which basically um, have widespread popular support, and more often than not, they are more powerful than the military themselves, and the, the country themselves also depend on these um, on these terrorist groups to prevent to protect them from external threats and ensure stability. We see these groups, like what they have pointed out, the Hamas and the Al-Aqsa, and unless side proposition can propose a solution which can effectively deal with the existence of such groups, we think we take this debate. So moving on to a few points of contention. Firstly, no thank you, madam. Which side creates a safer society? Other, um, whether or not their side actually creates a safer society? And second of all, whether or not it actually undermines democracy? So on the first level, on the first um, point of contention, we're going to look at it on two tiers, right? Ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, on division. Secondly, on violence. So they talked about how basically this will create a lot of division in society. But ladies and gentlemen, we don't think that these terrorist groups are in and of themselves extremists in the first place. The only reason why they were, they become like this is because they are perpetrated by the Western media, something that's inherently bad, something that we don't think that side proposition should even allow to happen. Secondly, on the idea of violence, they kept talking about how basically these terrorist groups Engage, uh, engage in very violent means. But first of all, we say this only for retaliation, right, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the Tamas and look at Fatah, right? The only reason why they're actually, uh, they are actually engaging in violence is because they are retaliating in response to the US and Israel preventing them from allowing aid to reach the innocent civilians. We think that is for a good cause and we don't see anything wrong with that. But before that, yes. We think that the fact that they are doing this to people and the people still support them, clearly it means that they must have a certain political cause, right, ladies and gentlemen, and clearly it means that people think that they best represent their interests. We think that the idea of a democracy, something that your side wants to uphold, is that they have the mandate of the people, and given that they have the support, we don't see what's so wrong with that. So this really brings me very nicely on to a second point about how they undermine a democracy. Firstly, we think that most of them, first of all, no thank you, sir, we think that they are extremely moderate, so they won't even turn to buy the means. But more importantly, we think that even if they're extremely radical, as side proposition would like you to believe them to be something that they are actually not, we think that it's an idea of international light, right, ladies and gentlemen. We think that these groups have been fighting so hard all along because they want the legitimacy of the international community, right, ladies and gentlemen. We think that under your side, the moment you reject them from the democratic process, they that, hey, we're going to exclude you, even though I, um, what the Western world has always been saying, we want to protect a perfect democratic system and you're still going to exclude certain groups it's only going to further uh, exacerbate the problem in society and more importantly we think that these groups in the first place are going to consider that there's going to be international um, a lot of international light on them and they're not going to react very um, they're not going to react very harshly um, regardless of the situation so moving on right to my case divide as the first speaker today I'll be talking to you about the need to involve the, these political wings in the parties Flora will then go on to tell, or Jonathan will then go on to tell you about the necessity of maintaining these militant wings. So before we actually examine why there's a need, let's first recognize the nature of these groups, right? We think that, first of all, they're extremely um, organized and they have very strong links to the village elders. They also enjoy tremendous support from the people. Why? Not because they're violent, as such proposition says, but rather, no thank you, madam, because they give strong social services to the people and they have extremely strong grassroots support and links with the villagers, right, ladies and gentlemen. We see this in the Taliban, in the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan and the Pashtun Valley. We see that, in fact, these groups only exist because of the support from the people. No, thank you, sir. We really question, ladies and gentlemen, this group of people who have no formal training, no income at all, and more importantly, they resort to guerrilla tactics. Why is it that they see such support? Because they take care of the interests of the people, and ultimately, we see that that's a good thing, and we don't see why you should be excluding them from the political process. More importantly, we think that the fact that the only way that they can get support is through the people, and the people are still willing to give it to them, we don't see a problem with that. Yes. First of all, these moderate groups also include the terrorist organizations. Second of all, they only murder because they're retaliating. Something your side really has to deal with instead of insisting over 
over again to get their murderers right, ladies and gentlemen. You think that ultimately these people are only retaliating and they are not actually doing it out of their own free will, no thank you sir. More importantly, we think as a natural aversion against violence in human nature, right, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think anyone for no good reason will go out and try to kill random people for no good reason. We ultimately think that there's a political cause behind it, it's also a meaningful cause. And that's why we think it's important that you don't, you don't try to undermine these terrorist organizations and you give them the respect and the legitimacy they deserve. More importantly, let's take a look, right? We see that there are also alternatives in place, right? We see that in Afghanistan, apart from the Taliban, the they could also, the people can also turn to legitimate um, governments in the parliament to protect the people. But the fact that they still choose the Taliban over um, the of the the legitimate government. No, thank you, sir. And given the presence of the alternative, the people still support the Taliban, and we show that these groups best protect their rights, and therefore we must allow them to run for elections. And more than that, we don't see why your side can exclusively exclude people from a democratic election. No, thank you, madam. Second of all, I'm also going to tell you why they are um, neutral, basically, in these groups. Right? They are basically the political wings and the military wings. Something that they are going to have to acknowledge in the first place. We think ultimately, this political, no thank you, madam, this political and military wings are extremely dependent on one another because ultimately, we think that um, the two derive legitimacy from one another. So, more importantly, let's move on to why there's a need to actually involve in the political process. On a principal level, we see that first of all, they, they, they enjoy the mandate of a significant part of the society and we see that these political wings are, legiti are a legitimate representation of the societal opinions and it's unjust to simply exclude them. But more importantly, on a practical level, right, ladies and gentlemen, we think that there's a need to include them in the process because very often, once there exists a legitimate way for them to govern and participate constructively in the political process, these military wings no more reason to resort to violence eventually become co-opted into joining the state military that's extremely important on the outside of the house. So, ladies and gentlemen, really we also think that on the outside, right, people, because people in general have no appetite in senseless violence, this ultimately will create a moderation effect and ultimately um, the, wings, the political wings who are ultimately very responsive to the people's needs will actually take care of the people and for all these reasons, please walk with that proposition. Members of this house, there is always an alternative to violence. That is the problem with side opposition. We do not think that terrorist groups which murder innocent people who have nothing to do with their cause should ever be allowed in the parliament. And that's why I'm going to take their case down through two main points of clash. First, on which policy best rebuilds society and best rebuilds the political system. Second, on which policy better reduces violence. Let's first look at society. Here they told us that people have the right to vote in terrorist organizations. They never responded at all to the liar logic coming from my first proposition speaker, who told you that you should not allow in terrorist groups which do not support democracy, whose very aims in ideology go against the premise of democracy. Groups like Jamaa al-Islamia, who aim to establish an Islamic caliphate in Southeast Asia, these groups clearly do not stand for the foundations to which democracy is built, and they would undermine parliament if you let them in. Then they told us that terrorist, group, uh, terrorist groups are good rep representatives of minorities. First we say, no, that's not true. Ordinary people, no thank you, are not concerned about the use of violence. Ordinary people all across the world who terrorist groups claim to represent are concerned about ordinary issues, like having bread on their table, like having water and sewage issues. That's why when Mahmoud Abbas managed to achieve recognition for Palestine in the United Nations, ordinary people cheered him and his non-violent policies, not Hamas and his violent policies. 
More than that, terrorist groups often don't have any coherent socio-economic program. Just look at what Hamas has done to the Gaza Strip and West Bank. It has caused inflation to rise by a third. It has completely destroyed, oh, no thank you, any semblance of a, legit, of a legitimate economy in the region. That is why these terrorist groups hurt the people on the ground. Here they give us this example of the Taliban, which we think is quite incongruous. Because what we say is, first of all, the Taliban arose in Afghanistan and Pakistan, not in the West Bank. But the Taliban did not arise because it was a movement supported by the people. It was a coalition of Mujahideen groups which took power forcibly by violence. And that is why we say terrorist groups are not supported by the people, often take power through violence. Their assertion that these groups generally come into power because they some kind of popular support just doesn't stand. The next they told us that people support the Taliban now. To which our question is, how do you know? First of all, we say it is not legitimate to support a group whom in its ideology aims to hurt everyone else in your nation. Like how Hamas aims to wipe out the state of Israel, thereby hurting the rest of Jewish society. Democracy is premised on the protection of majorities with minority rights, not the privileging of one group over another. Therefore, this on the first ground is illegitimate. People do not support the Taliban. They've given no evidence to show this is true. And in fact, we see, we see Afghans today rising up against supposed popular support for the Taliban and supporting civil society groups, which oppose both the government of Hamid Karzai and the Taliban as well. Next, they told us that it's okay for terrorists to go into parliament because the violence they carried out was legitimate. No, as we already told you, you cannot hurt innocent people when there's nothing to do with your cause in the process of getting into parliament. But our, our second line of response, which they never really responded to, was this. There are always alternatives. There are moderate groups which represent, which represent minorities equally well. There are minority groups which have coherent socio-economic programs and can better represent people because they can work with the government, because they get international support and aren't going to be sanctioned by international organizations the moment they get in power. We point you to the Social Labour and Democratic Party in Ireland, which had a huge amount of support. In fact, well, thank you, much more than Gary Adams and the Sinn Féin, part and the Sinn Féin Party when it was in power in Northern Ireland. We point you to the Communist Party of India, a non-violent alternative to India's Naxalites, who currently run Kerala and Maharashtra, two of the most successful states in India. Clearly these parties can represent minorities without the use of violence, so the premise of their case just falls. Next, let's move on to this issue of reducing violence. Here they told us that we exacerbate the problem when we don't let them in the parliament. We say we exaggerate the problem when you don't let, when you let these terrorists in the parliament. Why would terrorists give up a trump card, violence, which has served them so well all this time? As they themselves admitted, violence is what gains them support in the first place. More than that, my first speaker told you that they can use violence to intimidate other parties and bully them during elections. No thank you, a line of logic their speaker never really responded to. That is why so far, their case falls. I'm moving on now to my points of substantive, where I'm going to show you first how the use allowing terrorists in the parliament escalates regional violence. What do we tell you here? The reason why this is so is because allowing terrorists to gain parliamentary influence in the nation risks expanding terrorist and criminal activity all throughout the region. The problem is that, hold on a minute, Adam, even if we accept that terrorist groups are well intentioned, they often develop extensive links with other criminals, with other terrorist groups out of necessity or just because it's very profitable. Don't you agree? Madam, I have just told you in my rebuttals that it does not moderate them. It does not moderate them when they can use violence to intimidate other groups, to have your government do nothing about it when its terrorist members are sitting on police boards. It does not moderate them when the reason people voted them into parliament in the first place was because of violence. We cannot accept that line. You have to show us why it still stands. Moving on to my substantive. Once terrorists get into power, they use their political influence to shelter and collaborate with other groups in society. If they sit on policing boards, they use their parliamentary influence to protect other terrorists in the region. They cover up their misdeeds in the, in, in the media. The reason this is bad is because these groups often have external agendas. Terrorist groups or criminals from outside the nation do not care about minorities in the oppressed, but the groups which currently rule are forced to support them because of the patronage external terrorist groups have given them in the past. Let me give you an example. When Hamas went into power in Gaza, it invited Hezbollah to open up shop in Gaza. It invited Hezbollah to launch rocket attacks on Israeli cities from Gaza, escalating violence in the region. Hashim Tashi, the Prime Minister of Kosovo, actively works with Czech and Albanian mafias who propped him up during the Kosovo Liberation Army's campaign for liberation and allows those groups to use Kosovo as a base for human trafficking. The solution then is not to allow terrorist groups to run for power, not to allow them to subvert our state from within by gaining parliamentary and electoral 
influence, therefore protecting lives and saving the region from violence, which is especially critical in the kind of post-conflict states we're talking about today. I'm moving on to my next substantive, where I'm going to show you how it is our side that preserves international aid. Why? Because when we don't allow terrorists for run, to run for election, foreign governments don't cut off aid and vital international support. The problem today is that international governments and bodies in the aftermath of the war on terror are desperate to weed out terrorist groups. And that means that they don't give aid and support to governments which support terrorism. And ladies and gentlemen, asking a terrorist group to run for parliament is more or less tantamount to supporting terrorism because they can recruit, because they can spread their rhetoric. Why is this bad? When other international organizations cut up aid to a terrorist group, it hurts their credibility in the United Nations. In the worst of cases, it earns them over international hostility because overseas states are afraid that a terrorist group will then use this country as a base to attack them. In Gaza, when the Palestinian Authority allowed Hamas to run, Israel and Egypt cut off the Rafah border crossing with Egypt, imposed a combined economic blockade, which ramped up inflation by a third and hurt the lives of ordinary people. What then is the solution? When terrorist groups aren't allowed to run for power, we reassure international bodies and agencies. When we send a strong message that terror isn't tolerated, this ensures reconciliation, this helps moderate groups to gain power, and ensures that international organizations continue supporting the legitimacy of the state. Why was Mahmoud Abbas able to gain recognition for Palestine as an observer state in the United Nations? It, it, it's because Fatah is non-violent, unlike Hamas, and that's what allowed Mahmoud Abbas to gain, for the first time, recognition that Palestine is a sovereign state. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, because those who deny freedom to others never deserve it for themselves, side with proposition. Can you guys hear me? One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Ladies and gentlemen, it's sad to see that that side of the house has come under the influence of Western media. Look, the Western media portrayed ANC, right, and Nelson Mandela as a terrorist organization and jailed him under the justice. Now Nelson Mandela is given a Nobel Peace Award as given uh, and said to be one of the best peace fighters in our world today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Western media, the Western rhetoric is something that is very detrimental to society, is something that we cannot base a debate upon today, right? Let's look at today's debate as a whole. We cannot debate in a vacuum, we must, like they propose that we do, right? We think we must look at the nature of such countries. And when we look at the nature of such countries that we're talking about, countries like Afghanistan, we don't think that we have much choices to start with, right? We look at how the Afghanistan government now doesn't really hold any power outside Kabul, right? We think there is a problem with that, and we think that these people obviously do not have the support of the majority of the people. More, more importantly, right, let's look at what is a terrorist organization in the first place. Something I'll look at in my speech. They, they give us examples about Al-Qaeda and how they bomb people and everything, right? Ladies and gentlemen, we think that these people are not the main kinds of terrorist groups that our policy aims to help or aims to improve the situation in the countries in the first place, right? We think that Al-Qaeda will never ever ever get support if they were going to run for a um, party or run for an election in the first place. The people that we're talking about in today's debate are the Fatahs and the Hamas, for example, right? where we think that these people have allowed the Palestinians to maintain some sort of life, right? They're under their rhetoric about how Israel is blocking aid, right? And that's why there's an inflation. It's not because these people 
people uh, have no government governmental policies. It's because Israel is blocking it, uh, blocking food and water from going into Palestine. If there's a lack of supply, then obviously there will be an inflation, right? So we think that Rebbe has come here to shift the debate away, and we don't think it's really fair in any paradigm whatsoever. But furthermore, let's talk about how these people are supposed to be killing machines. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't think that these people are killing machines, right? As we have already proven to you in Rachel's speech, right, that these people also have husbands, these people also have wives, and these people also have families. We see at the end of the day, these people do not go through military training, right? They're not like the Mount Abu or the Israel Special Forces, right? They are trained to kill and assassinate Hamas leaders, right? These people are fighting because they are their land is being taken away slowly and surely by the Israelis, right? These these people are fighting because they have no food at their supermarkets, right? These are the reasons why these people are fighting. These people are not fighting for the sake of fighting because we don't think anyone in the world does that in the first place, right? More importantly, they, uh, more importantly, right? No, thank you, sir. More importantly, what actually happens under their side is that they create a paradigm that as long as you're Islam, as long as you don't follow the American policy, you're deemed as terrorists, right? We see that Baptista, the ex-Cuban, um, President was also killing his people, right? And when under that, the US supplied him with arms to kill his people, right? When the Taliban existed before the uh, before the US came in the picture in 2001, we see that the US supported the Taliban by giving them arms, right, to fight against the Soviet Union, right? So we think that their side of the house is hypocritical in the fact that they don't look at all aspects of the picture. But more importantly, we provide you three reasons why under our side of the house, these people will necessarily what? stop killing, right? No thank you. Firstly, because we see that there is a burden on them to behave responsibly, something that is clearly lacking on their side. Secondly, we see that under this allows of the house, we, these moderate parties can keep their radical people under check, right? And we think that that is good in the long run. Thirdly, we think that when these people go into power, they necessarily have higher stakes to protect their people, right? Therefore, they will not be radicalized, therefore, they will not do something stupid, right? We think that is common sense, we think that that's the correct logic. More importantly, you say that no one will support them around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't think that the world is made out of one country called the United States of America, right? We think there's always another country in the world called China. And we think that China will always support different people, and we think that that's sin, right? Look, the United States of America caused a um, our Assad, a terrorist, right? But we see that China and Russia have been supporting him, so we think that these people will get support, these people will grow, right? No thank you. But moving on to my case problem, our first, my first substantive is how it's necessarily harmful in their side of the house, right? We see in their, in their paradigm, in the end, if such groups are excluded from political processes, they tend to, they tend to increase radicalism, right? Leading to increased internal and external turmoil. This gives external powers, causes to intervene, and humanitarian, under humanitarian grounds. When this happens, what ultimately happens is that there will be turmoil, there will be violence in those countries. We think that turmoil and violence is necessarily bad because people are dying and, and children do not have food. We see that happening in Iraq, we see that happening in Afghanistan. We ask them, we challenge them to deal with that later. No thank you. But more importantly, right, let's look at my second part of substantive about how it's unnecessary or how it's bad for the government to allow or to cause or have to have an incentive or make people necessarily disarm before they can go into to run for politicians or run for political parties in the first place. Right? But before I move on, yes, ma'am. You would have China and Russia as international support when they don't have elections and support the use of chemical weapons by changes against people. How is that fair? Um, ma'am, I don't think as long as you don't have elections means you're necessarily a bad country. Um, I think there are many countries around the world who necessarily embrace not having elections. While having a democratic country is good, we think that the whole reason I said that point was to prove to you that there will definitely be people who help these countries, right? Who give aid to these countries. And when they do, what happens is that these countries are necessarily disarmed and they have no incentive to use chemical weapons, right? If you're not know, listening to me. More importantly, let's move on to my case proper, right? We see that these political parties need radical wings because they are unable to defend themselves. They are unable to defend their country and society, right? Where without these uh, radical wings or without these armed groups, who are going to defend these people in the first place? We see that these groups have emerged from fire, right? These groups have emerged from large amounts of violence. To give you the example of the Hamas and the Fatah, they were formed as a result of losing their country to the Westerners, right? To the Israelis who were meant to take who were meant to take everything from them in the first place. No thank you. 
Furthermore, right, we see that because of this, they are distrustful to this arm. And it's seen as a ploy from the West that every time you say that you can't be a political party because you disarm, if you don't disarm, you are seen, uh, it's seen as a ploy, right? And we think that that can be seen from the very fact that multiple assassin attempts have been made on the Hamas leaders, right? And we think that some of them have actually been successful. We think that that this causes the, these parties to be very paranoid. Then what happens if one day I do this arm and I get attacked the next day, right? We think that these, that the rhetoric that they talk about is not only built up by people, by the Palestinians, right? We think it takes two hands to clap. We think that the Israelis has also created rhetoric about how they're going to invade the Gaza Strip, how they're going to send the tanks in, rolling in once, once the once the people of Palestine do something, right? We think that some, we think that it takes two hands to clap. We don't necessarily think it's a fault on that of those Hamas and Israelis, right? Or on the Hamas. But more importantly, let's look at how it will fit to the rhetoric of the hardliners. Because it, it's seen as a ploy as, of the West, what happens is that it feeds into the rhetoric of the people, whereby all the hardliners have to do is, hard, uh, is to hide behind something like the, the East is going to invade us, or other people are going to invade us, and what we are going to do is that we need this army to protect ourselves. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I'm immensely proud to oppose. They never told us anything in response to it. 
So what happens when these terrorists do actually run within the election system? Let's give you one more example. Those are actually sir. The Ulster Loyalist Democratic Party in Northern Ireland, when they didn't gain electoral success after trying in 1984, in 1994, they assaulted and killed people in a crowded pub, killing six and wounding five. And this was only a precursor to numerous other violent activities that they engaged in after not being elected into parliament. That's just one example out of numerous, such as the ETA in Spain, where they went on the killing spree three months after they failed to enter parliament. What does this show us? Number one, these people don't even have the mandate of the people that they claim to represent. But number two, because they don't have the mandate of the people, they continue engaging in even more violence and causing more destruction to the societies that they want to protect. We don't really see how it works, and we've proven how it falls in all circumstances. So what do we stand for on the side of the population? We told you that as long as you renounce your violence and you break away from terrorist organizations completely and you don't use violence anymore, then that's perfectly fine. You can run within the electoral process and we don't have an issue with that whatsoever. But they never told us why that wouldn't work. Because if these people were so concerned about representing the views of the minorities, then they shouldn't have a problem whatsoever. Hold on a moment, sir, with making sure that they renounce violence to make sure they're actually able to take these minority views into power. But before I move on, yes. So So, if you want to renounce violence but don't give up your arms, we don't think that's very sincere at all and we're not going to allow it to <laughs> So let's move on. This is where I transition to the second point of contention. Of what's actually best for democracy? The problem here is that side of the opposition didn't really understand what democracy was. Because here's what they told us. They told us the world isn't about the US and there are other countries like China. Really, they wanted the support of countries like China who supported Bashar al-Assad using chemical weapons against his own people. If that is the kind of society which they want to have, a world which is supported by people who use chemical weapons against their people, we think that's far more dangerous than a terrorist organization in and of itself. But taking this a step further, they then told us that democracy isn't really important. If that's the case, why are we having this debate in the first place? Democracy is important because of the views of the people, to make sure that everyone's view is represented within your parliament, to make sure that everyone's view is protected, that concrete change can happen to represent all these people within your society. And the best way to do that is through a moderate political process and not through violence. We haven't really heard a response from them yet. But what else did they tell us? And then second substantive, no thank you. They told us about exclusion being bad. Well, the problem is if you're using violence, you're excluding the rest of society in any case. But let's take this a step further. All he told us is that without weapons, you can't protect yourself. Unfortunately, the only reason why other people are being engaged in your society in the first place is because there are some people who are using weapons against everybody else. And that is the problem. The issue here is this. When we have terrorists within our society, we don't pander them to their interests and let them hold the rest of our society hostage. The solution to that is making sure that we have even tougher legislation and we crack down on these terrorists even harder to make sure that they don't hold sway over the rest of society, how we function, and every other individual's rights and freedoms within a country. That is something that we never heard a response to anyway. In addition to this, they told us about the international community, but they never really recognized that the international community doesn't stand for violence either. Therefore, we give you examples such as Hamas and what actually happened when they abused violence against their own people. No thank you, man. These are examples of things of what happens to the international community and how they frown upon things such as the use of violence within our society. We never actually heard a response to that either. Let's give you another example. The Moor Islam, the Moor Islam Liberation Front in the Philippines, when they couldn't defend the people, the government of Indonesia and Philippines came in and killed civilians in the crossfire. These are examples of what actually happens when you have terrorist organizations trying to run the country concrete harm that they were never able to deal with. Therefore, on the side of the proposition, we gave you many nuanced arguments, key arguments which they were never able to deal with on the side of the opposition. Here, let me resurrect the second piece of substantive on the loss of international support, because this was something which was completely untouched, because they failed to recognize that when you allow terrorists to work within your government and to represent your people on an international level, it completely threatens the credibility and legitimacy of your government as well. Thus, no international community wants to support a violent government. That was key analysis we can miss as well. That substantive still stands strong on our side. No thank you, man. What else did we tell you? His other substantive was about destabilizing the region. Because if you have one government which is comprised of terrorists, how are you going to be able to crack down on terrorists in the rest of the region? As a matter of fact, terrorism will flourish under the side of the opposition. That's again something that they weren't able to deal with. So we don't only need to protect the societies within the country, but we protect the region as well. Something they were never able to respond to. At the end of the day, the side of the proposition was one that was more nuanced and actually understood what democracy was and what terrorist organizations stood for and what they did within our society. We gave you a number of ideas. Number one, why it's always bad to legitimize terrorism under any circumstances. Number two, about making politics non-violent and why that was of particular importance to our society. 
Thirdly, on why societal divisions are even more dangerous when you have terrorists operating within your parliamentary system. Fourthly, on the loss of international support. And lastly, on destabilizing the region. Many of these ideas were completely untouched by the side of the opposition. On the side of the proposition, we believe that those who deny freedom to others do not deserve it for themselves. Then we say that these parties should still be allowed to run and to represent the people. 
Now we also told you that we're moderates. We, when you have hand in hand political and the, the midterm brings together, working together in, in an election, in a political process. We see that they were trying, that, that, that because now they will be gaining more legitimacy by representing the people in, in parliament, that then ultimately that these, that these radicals or these militant wings will try to buy into the idea and methods of, 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 of the moderates in doing things, in being more peaceful in, in coming, in coming uh, in implementing um, policies. And therefore we see that once they gain legitimacy, firstly, they feel that there will be no more need for violence and this ultimately will create a more peaceful society. Because we see that when you don't allow them to run, ultimately their first resort and first defense is, is, is to react out in violence. And this is not something that we want to see when these people already hold on to arms. And we see that the best situation here, when you already have this problem of terrorist groups that, that with a huge influence on the people, then we see the best solution here is to allow them to run for an election and not to create an even worse situation where, where, where these people will act out in violence because they were not allowed to represent the people. Now this is further emphasized in, uh, in the example where after Fata was recognized as a legitimate governing party, and, and, and we actually saw that there was a ceasefire in Israel when they agreed to recognize Fata, the little wing of um, Fata, um, El, um, El Aqsa, actually ceased to be violent and, and this brought an end to all the violence and conflicts in that region. And ultimately we see that cooperation between the militant and political wings will lead to greater stability in a country. Now on to the second question on how do we best deal with these terrorist groups given that they exist. Now they came out here to tell us that, that with all these um, terrorist groups and their political wings, that ultimately there will be a division in society. And this will make society even more bitter. But we see that by forcing, this, that by forcing these parties of the election process, um, like as, as I mentioned earlier, that violence actually becomes the last resort. And given that the pol political wing receives, um, uh, if, if the political wings do not receive any more support, we ultimately see that the moderates will end up joining the radicals. And this will actually create even more instability in the country, well, something that we don't want to see. Yes, sir. Your second speaker told us that democracy is important. Therefore, by that logic, are you fine with the terrorist organization seizing control of the state and turning it solely into a terrorist state? A terrorist state is not something that will happen because we see that ultimately the reason they made that and, and, and the entire assumption is that these terrorist groups are violent, that these terrorists are being violent. But, we see, but what I, I characterized from the very beginning of my speech was that they are not inherently violent and only react on in, react on in violence when, when they are provoked, something that the West always seeks to do because they believe that their democratic ideals are more superior. But we see that, that what happens is that under the international community, they ultimately because uh, that ultimately because they are, they are running for an election, then there's a greater stake that they want to have in this society. Given that now they have this, that they are accountable to the people and, and, and that they will actually cease to be led, they will cease to be even more violent because, because when it comes to loans from the IMF, when coming, uh, when, when um, it's important to get policies and support from the international community, ultimately that, that when these political wings gain widespread legitimacy, that these groups as a whole will be less likely to cause overseas attacks and will actually ensure for more stability in the country. Now on the next idea on how that if as long as this group, as long as this um, political wings give up arms, it's okay for them to run. But we see firstly that it's unusual to ask these parties who want to represent the people to give up their arms. We see that, they, um, that, that in the first place that giving up arms will potentially cause um, cause the West to step in to impose democracy, something that the people don't agree with. And we, and we don't want to allow for this loophole to take place that will further sh shape the stability of these countries. We also see that they need these military groups because given that the rest of the country is against them, when the West seeks to, pepper, uh, seeks to, seeks, um, to portray to the entire world that these terrorist groups are inherently violent and, 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 and cause massive chaos, we see that in the case of these foreign threats, that the only way for these terrorist groups to protect themselves is, is, is um, through holding arms, um, is, is through holding arms, and that they are the only ones capable of defending themselves in, in such situations. And therefore, for all these reasons, considering the fact that, that the stability of these countries is of utmost importance, and that these terrorist groups ultimately receive the support and the other people, it's not right for you to cut them out of the election process.
When Rachel started her speech, she clearly asked the side opposition to form or tell us why their government will be more stable than us, why their country will be more stable than us. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't think they fulfilled their orders, we don't think they have done what they're supposed to do in today's debate. Because I don't think anything stands for anything if the country is not stable. We don't think anything stands for anything if people don't stop getting killed. And we think that this debate has been brought down to three stories, right? Three misconstruction stories. The first misconstruction is how they misconstructed themselves, right? They say about how people will continue pointing AK-47s in the face of innocent civilians. We think that the only reason why they are doing this is because they have no way to form or no way to let out their views, no way to let out what they think is right, right? We don't think that there's a legitimate way when the American government, when other governments come in to suppress them, right? We think when that happens, they turn to their AK-47s. That is one misconstruction, right? Another thing under their point, they haven't proven to us why there's something called mutual retaliation. Something that we made very important since the start of the debate. Given that we think that these people, like the Fatah and the Hamas, only fight because they are invaded and because they are threatened in the first place. Thirdly, they have never given us what they are going to do with these terrorist groups in the first place, right? Given that terrorist groups are always going to exist, and given that there's always going to be different views, right? They have not given us what we are going to do, and said they are going to take a hardline stance on them, which we think will never work. The second thing that they misconstructed, right, is that we misconstructed the terrorists that we are talking about in this debate, right? At the start, they have picked the most extreme, the most um, hard to debate example, right? They have given us the Al Qaeda, right? Which you think is unfair and we have proven to you already why it shouldn't exist in today's debate, right? And even if it does, we think that it's not one of our main priorities. Secondly, they say that these people don't have the mandate of the people. But if we have clearly proven to you that examples like the Hezbollah, right, which already have 12 um, seats in parliament and they are not killing anybody whatsoever, right? So we think that these people do have the mandate of the people, that these people do not kill people like they put it, right? Thirdly, they haven't been able to deal with us about how people like the Fatah, how people like the Hamas will not be able to survive in those countries without grassroots support, right? Like, I mean, after a certain point in time, if you keep pointing guns at people's faces, they'll get sick and tired. They'll run to other groups like the guys, uh, like the, the other governments, right? Or to other moral parties and get them to clamp down, right? Why didn't people in Afghanistan run to the government and ask them to, to support the government and then ask them to shoot the Taliban, right? We think that that is not possible. They also have a proven us on that point about why these nations won't be able to why these people aren't seen as freedom fighters, that how these people, will, these nations will not necessarily be able to survive without these people. And we think that's very important because these people are often seen as heroes, not as terrorists, as the Western media portrays them. The third important thing is how they have misconstructed us in today's debate. We have not said that democracy is not important. All we have asked in today's debate, and all we have said in today's debate, was that you do not need a democratic country to provide aid to these countries, right? We say that other countries like China and Russia can provide um, the, um, aid to these countries, and, chi and, and these, China and Russia not necessarily ask these countries to change and become a non-democratic country, right? We think that democratic, uh, democracy is an important process, and we think that they are misconstructed us in that place. Furthermore, we do not stand for violence. But contrary to them, we think that we should end the violence because we we think that the only way that you are only able to end the violence is you allow these people have a, a legitimate out, 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 outlook, right? To in order to champion their own rights, to order to stand for election and fight for the people that that support them in the first place, right? That's the way that we think we can stop violence, and we provide providing three reasons for that. Something that they haven't come back to contend with in today's debate, and hence for all these reasons, I'm extremely proud to oppose. strong, 
and at peace with itself. And I'm going to show you how this is true by taking you on a walk through the nation of side opposition. Now this nation, by the end of this debate, was not really standing for political wings. It was standing for terror, straight out and undisguised. They tried to deceive us at the start of the debate by claiming that these terrorist groups support minorities. When what really was happening in their nation was that the vast majority of people hated to see the terrorists who had bombed their brother's house, who had raped their sister in parliament. They failed to see that these vast majorities of people would never support the terrorist group in parliament, would never buy into their nation, and would never support a society that they came to create. And that was why at the end of this debate, they asked a broken society filled with bitterness. But they failed to see the, re the reality behind the rhetoric of what really happens to minorities. Because minorities had 80 47s, but no jobs. Minorities were given plastic explosives, but no food. And that was why in our third speaker we told you that it was their world where terrorist groups which claimed to represent minorities trivialized their concerns and turned them only to violence. To which they tried to retreat by telling us that these groups were only violent because they really have something to defend. I'm sorry, just because you were attacked in the past doesn't give you the right to bomb school buses full of innocent children. Just because you suffered in the past doesn't give you the right, like Hamas tries to, to wipe out another state, to wipe out another people with their dreams and hopes and aspirations. That was something we told you, and that was a reality that their world was never able to face up to. So what was their final line of defense? They told us, we are scared. We will let you into parliament so that maybe, just maybe, you will renounce violence. The problem was, no terrorist group renounced violence. They never renounced violence because as they admitted, these terrorist groups know that violence is what got them into power in the first place. They never renounced violence when they come out in the 2006 Ramal shootings, they could use this violence to intimidate and scare other political parties into supporting them in parliament. They never renounced violence because like what we told you about the IRA, which actively promoted both uh, the Armanite and ballot box strategy, violence was used as another means by which to gain political power. This was another reality their world was unable to face. They tried to tell us that we need weapons to protect political parties. Well, to which we, our response was, this means that it's far less easy for policemen to catch terrorists. Maybe it's a good thing a terrorist is armed, because that means they can't bomb buses full of innocent school children. That means they can't bomb the houses of innocent people. That was also something they couldn't really respond to. At the end of this debate, their nation was just like Afghanistan. Allowed terrorists into power, lost international support, and was invaded by the United States. Finally, they were telling us that China would come to the rescue. China, which supports chemical weapons. Russia, which supports Bashar al-Assad. Ladies and gentlemen, that was not a nation we wanted to live in. On the side of proposition, our nation was rather different. Because we gave you examples from all across the world. Spain, Ireland, Egypt, the West Bank. Not just Afghanistan and Pakistan, but like on their side. And in all these nations, the nations where terrorists were not allowed in the parliament were nations at peace with themselves. They were nations where terrorist groups which were truly sincere about entering politics renounced violence first, like al Gamma al-Islamia in Egypt. And it was these nations where society was not resentful, where society didn't hate one another, where there were no pogroms because society was constantly reminded of the violence of the past. It was these nations which were run by parties like the SLDP and the CPIK, parties which promoted true socio-economic development which really stood up for the interests of minorities. It was these nations which, like the Palestine of Mahmoud Abbas, could walk proud on the international stage, knowing that violence never works. Abraham Lincoln's words are as relevant today as when he first spoke them. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves.
very much to both teams for what you also just a proper and quite entertaining event. And thank you very much to everybody here for being a great audience and for coming to watch this fight. It was a good debate in many respects. The judges were impressed by the level of argumentation, the way the teams were able to integrate um, real-world examples into their case, the way the teams um, structured their cases and reached out to and engaged us as an audience. There were many things that did impress us. I think you know, you know, this is a large group, a large audience, and although some of the speakers um, um, rose to the occasion a little bit better than others in terms of stylistics, we thought most of the speakers did a very good job in terms of reaching out to us, engaging us as an audience, not just focusing on the judges at the front, but really taking it and filling the space in this quite large group. What did this debate boil down to? Well, there's one thing I'll say at the beginning that did lend a little bit of confusion to this debate. It was very clear from the beginning of the debate what the teams considered to be a terrorist organization. What we perhaps never got a very clear definition of is what do we mean by the political wing of a terrorist organization? Neither team quite clearly defined that. And there were times during this debate where perhaps the focus was a little bit more on whether or not terrorism might be a legitimate thing to begin with under any possible circumstances, or whether there's no possible reasonable reason to resort to violence and terrorism. And there's quite a lot of time spent focusing on that, as opposed to, well, assuming terrorist groups do exist, is it reasonable for the, for the political wings of those organizations to engage in politics through standing for and potentially being elected to and being a member of the parliament? There were times when the debate did focus on that, but we would have liked to have seen a little bit more clear focus throughout the debate on that. So that was one thing that led to a little bit of confusion. But that shouldn't take away from the quality of the argumentation that there was from both teams, because there were a number of good points that they did choose to engage on that were engaged on very well. We were impressed um, by the way the teams managed to take a number of real-world examples use them to illustrate their arguments and really not just look at this debate on a theoretical level, but see how it's playing out in the, the well, I'll say in various regions of the world. There were times during the debate though where we seemed to get very bogged down in focusing on the Middle Eastern region. Um, yes, there were times where other examples did come in, Sinn Féin and the IRA in Ireland, the classic separatist Eto in Spain. We did have sort of token examples from those, but mostly this debate ended up becoming quite Middle Eastern focused. So very good use of examples, but we would have liked to have perhaps seen it broaden out and look at other regions and other, other aspects of the terrorism problem, more than those that are very specific to those of the Middle East. But what were the really key arguments that this debate ultimately settled on? Firstly, I think this whole idea of legitimacy. Is terrorism in general something that ever can be legitimate? Um, is the fact that they sometimes are, do have support among significant groups of the population and are fighting for what significant groups of the population consider to be reasonable causes, and the fact that they may not feel they have been getting, making any headway with um, other means, mean that sometimes it is um, legitimate to resort to violence. <coughs> And if that happens, should those people be allowed to engage in the political process beyond just those violent means? The proposition, the opposition told us that yes, that was reasonable in circumstances. The proposition told us that it wasn't, and that ultimately there can never be a reasonable justification for violence against innocents. And that went backwards and forwards between the teams. And the other really key area of argumentation in this debate was the whole idea of stability of the political system of the country and the region affected by that country in itself. Is once, once you take these type of groups out of the political system, does violence simply become their first resort where they could in fact have at least made attempts to engage through other areas? And is that going to lead to greater instability? The opposition said yes, yes it would. Or is the fact that they're likely to go and seek out other regional allies who may also be terrorist groups, or the fact that the international community is going to come to look down on a country that has these kind of groups within the governmental system, is that going to lead to even worse instability? The proposition told us that it would. So these were the things that the two teams argued backwards and forwards, and the judges ultimately had to weigh up which team had got the better of those arguments. We did, in the end, reach a unanimous decision that one team had been a little bit more consistent right from the start through to the end of the debate in the way it analyzed those points, 
the way it explained them to begin with, and the way it, it tackled the way the other team had raised those issues and showed that their particular model was going to be one that was going to ultimately lead to an increased level of legitimacy and stability. And that was the team that went on to win. But it was a good debate, some very good argumentation. Both teams engaged well, and we were impressed by both teams. We just felt that one team had that slight edge in the end. So I'll tell you first who the judges thought was the best individual speaker in this debate. We did have some discussion about this. There were a few different speakers that um, impressed us. But in the end, we came to a consensus decision. The best individual speaker in this debate was the third speaker from Anglo-Chinese Junior College. <laughs> judging panel and the champions of the Ministry of Education ACJC Intercollegiate Debates 2013 is the team from Anglo-Chinese.